Well, good morning and welcome to today's crop hour for which is our second day during our understanding research week. Anyhow, it is my name is Connie Strunk and I'm a plant pathology field specialist with SDCU Extension. And today it's my pleasure to introduce to you to my colleague and friend, Dr. Adam Varenhorst. He will be talking about soybean gall midge and sampling and a little bit of tips and tricks that he has learned about this pest. Um, Adam started with Extension back in 2015 where he received a phone call from myself saying, hey, we really need to go take a look at this field. There's something more sinister going on than just some disease. And we had a few different discussions about it, but ultimately it's now led to a lot of work for him. Anyhow, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Adam Varenhorst. All right, and I'm going to share my screen. And thank you for that introduction, Connie. And uh, as the slide here indicates, I am going to be speaking about soybean gall midge and specifically what we can do to sample for it and then just a little bit of an idea of what research we're working on for this pest. So as Connie mentioned, soybean gall midge was first reported as an issue in South Dakota in 2015, but it was reported in the Midwest before that Oops, it looks like I bumped my uh, buttons there. It was actually reported in the Midwest as early as 2011 in Nebraska. Uh, there was a short article they had on it and uh, it was more of an issue where they thought that they were having secondary infestations due to an injury on the plant. And that's what we think we are seeing in South Dakota as well. But if we fast forward a few years, then we started seeing more and more issues with this pest. And so it became evident that no, it's not just a pest that's getting into the plant due to injuries, something else is going on. And in 2018 and 19, a lot of work was done on it. And we actually determined that it's a new species. So a researcher out of Nebraska led that charge and worked with some specialists and they figured out that it's a new species, never been reported anywhere in the United States or the world. And its name is Riceella maxima. Now, the same researcher worked and was able to put a lot of time in and effort. And we actually were able to get a common name for it, which is the official name is soybean gall midge. Uh, so that's not just, we can't just point at it and say that this is the name of this pest. There's actually paperwork, and so that was all done, and now we have the official name, which makes it a lot easier than constantly saying R Maxima um, when we're talking about it. So what we know so far just from our initial observations is that this is a pest that shows up sometime in the spring. We don't know what triggers its emergence, but then it goes into soybean and it starts doing a lot of work on the soybean plants. And from previous years of research, we now know that there are at least, at least two generations each year. Now, the difficult part with figuring out how many generations this pest has is there's a lot of generational overlap. That is, when one generation is emerging, there can be a next generation emerging as well, and there might be more of those occurring. So it doesn't all just happen at once there's this overlap where individuals from the first generation can be emerging with the second generation and so on. But more work will be done to try to figure that out. We also know now that the female flies lay their eggs near the base of the plant or around wounds. So uh, there's been some work, uh, hail simulations, uh, when you hit the plants with ice to simulate hail, you get injuries and when the injuries occur, then we start seeing the soybean gall midge larva in those areas. And that matches up with what Connie and I first saw in South Dakota in 2015. We had a field where there had been a little bit of hail injury. There were a few diseases present. And it seemed like we just, wherever we had a disease plant or if we had a little bit of hail injury, that's where we could find these uh, gall midge larva. And so, 
with more work that we've been doing with this pest, we're finding that we can kind of pinpoint populations early in the season. And they're typically going to be higher in soybean that are next to trees or field edges. And if you have a field edge that is immediately adjacent to a cornfield that was soybean last year, it's almost 100% guarantee that if soybean gall midge is in your neighborhood and you've had a little bit the previous year, you're going to have issues with it uh, this year in your soybean. Uh, so they, they are emerging from that previous year's soybean and moving directly into this year's. Research in Nebraska has also found now that there are some alternative hosts, which include alfalfa and sweet clover, and a lot more research is going to be needed to be done to figure out how those play a role in this pest life cycle. And what we know is it overwinters in soybean fields in little silken cocoons. The larvae actually drop out of the plant. They go in the soil and then they spin these little cocoons so that they can overwinter. So it can overwinter in South Dakota. And if we look at where it's been confirmed so far, so a lot of miles have been put on vehicles going around and checking fields, we can see that it isn't just a big issue in South Dakota, it's an issue in a couple other states as well. And so 2018 is when this survey really took off. That's when it became very evident that we are having more than a nuisance pest or a secondary pest showing up in the soybean. Soybean gall midge were killing soybean. And so uh, when we got looking, we could find it in a lot of places. If you notice, we can find it right up, almost right up to the North Dakota border in Minnesota, they did. But we don't necessarily always find it in every county. And in some places, the conditions have to be right for us to find it. However, we're going to continue looking because there's a chance that as this pest continues to be an issue in the state, it might continue to spread and it, we might find it in more and more areas. So we'll continue looking. But in 2020, which is the yellow, we had three new counties in South Dakota, Minnesota had a couple new counties. And you can see just kind of spreading out from those initial ones. And we still check, we still do find it in these other counties. If you look though in South Dakota, we have uh, McCook County, which is a very unusual situation. We haven't been able to find it there. My guess is it's there and we just haven't looked in the right field because if it's bordering uh, that county on all sides, it's probably there. But 115 confirmed counties in five states in three years. So uh, we've even the last couple of years added Missouri. If we look at just South Dakota, we'll see that we have it in 26 counties. As I mentioned, it's probably in more our worst infestations in South Dakota tend to be kind of right here, especially the worst fields I've seen were actually in Union County, but that doesn't mean that some of these also don't have serious issues. But uh, what I've seen so far, and we'll see if that continues to be the trend, is that it shows up as we head north, it shows up later in the season. And so it's not quite as much of an issue, but we need to continue monitoring that to see if that continues to be the truth. So with the soybean gall midge, we are kind of sitting there thinking, well, how do we monitor this pest? Because, you know, by the time we go out and see it in the field as the larvae, it's too late. We can't really do anything because they're under the epidermis of the plant. And it's really hard to get insecticides to go into the epidermis of a plant to get to those larvae. And so first thoughts were, well, we should monitor for when it's emerging and see when it emerges and if it's a single flight or what's going on. And so what the researchers in the Midwest did was we all got together and we decided that we should use some emergence traps. And we actually just went and we modified corn rootworm emergence cages and uh, we followed with that design. So we actually built quite a few but if you look here in this picture, it's essentially a box, a uh, square to rectangular shape, depending on the craftsman in charge. And then there's this netting that's glued or stapled to it. And it comes up, there's a little hole in the netting right here. And then you have a glass jar 
up on top and the netting goes into that. And the whole idea is that when the flies emerge from the soil, this is in an infested field, they can only go up. They wanna go up towards the light and try to get out of this cage. And so they'll follow the mesh up and when they get into the jar because it's kind of a funnel here, they can't get back out. So uh, this effectively catches them as you can see here, all the little flies inside the jar. If you follow what's going on with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, these jars that we used to be able to get very easily, uh, those are now like gold. Uh, it's very hard to find these jars, especially uh, we are using fairly small ones. In some cases you might be able to find the glass, but we also need the rings because we uh, nail those onto the board that you see here so that we can attach it to the cage and it's not just flopping uh, on the ground. Uh, but yeah, we, we're going to have to see, we have some yet, from previous years, we wanted to expand this year, but we'll have to see uh, what we can do. So uh, that's going to be our greatest difficulty, I think this year in preparing our cages is just actually getting the jars, uh, which who would, have, who would have ever thought that would be our shortage on supplies. So, uh, but what we do is we put these cages once they're built out into bean stubble. And we do this on most cases after planting, especially if we're in farmer fields, because we don't want anybody to have to go and move a bunch of cages. And also a tractor and planter would destroy these things. They're not built uh, to last forever. So uh, we put them out there though, and then we check them weekly. So typically we wanna get out there as soon as we can, right after planting. And then we monitor and each time we check, we're looking for these little flies. Now the flies are fairly easy to identify. They're not very big. Uh, so there are a lot of small flies that we catch each, each time we go out there. A lot of things actually are emerging from the soil in the spring and it's not a huge surprise. It's a safe place to be when it's cold, but the flies are about a quarter of an inch long and that quarter of an inch actually starts at the front leg here and goes all the way to the back leg. So like I said, not very large. They have orange abdomens, so that would be this region right here. We can't see it because of the shiny wings, but that's orange. And then if you look, the real key characteristic for me is this pattern on the legs. So they alternate between light and dark and kind of a brown color too. Uh, so it's a lighter color than the black, but it alternates. As you get out, it's a little bit lighter the farther you are from the body. And they have these short little, uh, they're not real short, but they have these antenna uh, that are pretty distinct too. So those are the things we look for. And another big thing I mentioned, they're flies. So if they have more than one pair of wings, not the soybean gall midge. And if you look here, you can see these appendages right here, these little uh, white things. Those are what we call halters. Those are the modif modifications flies have instead of a second pair of wings. and in terms of what their function is, is uh, think of them as kind of like a gyroscope. So flies have one on each side of their body and that helps them to orient and to maneuver quickly. So uh, that's what the adults look like and that's what we're looking for in those jars. And so if we're in the right field uh, where we had an infestation the previous year and we normally work with our farmer collaborators to find those fields, but we can catch a lot of soybean gall midge adults in a given week. It just depends on if the uh, when the time's right and they're emerging, uh, we can catch quite a few. So here's what they look like in the jars. Uh, they kind of can't see the uh, orange as much, but you can see those patterns, even on this cell phone picture, you can see the patterns of their weight, uh, legs, sorry. And so that does stand out. And like I said, that's what helps me the most when identifying them. So small fly, pretty long legs, and they have that pattern on them. And so why are we doing all this collecting? Well, we're using it to form an alert network. And so you can sign up for this. I'll make sure to post the link at the end of the talk. I'll find that link and add it. But you can sign up for this alert network. And so what happens is each week we collect the individuals, we identify them, count them, 
to determine how many and then we report that to the network and then at the end of the week or whenever the report goes out you will get either a phone call email or both telling you where it was found what county and uh, that gives you an idea of if you want to try to manage them with foliar insecticides when would be the best time and if you notice we have our little circles here on the map that those represent where the traps are and then we have the numbers with yellow around them that represents the current week and then the red here represents if it was an increase or decrease from the previous sampling time so that's what this network looks like and so uh, the whole thing we're trying to do is to help people figure out when these are emerging as i said they don't emerge all at once and we're trying to figure out when the big emergences are so that we can try to do a little bit targeted management since we don't have a lot of options So from all of this work, what have we learned so far about their emergence? Well, they emerge over a very long period of time. And in some cases, uh, like I mentioned, the next generation is actually coming out of soybean while the first one can still be emerging from the soil. So uh, very long emergence period. And as I mentioned before, they have overlapping generations, which can make it a little bit trickier uh, but when we're sampling from the soil, we know that we aren't getting the next generation because those are uh, those can't get down into our soil beneath our traps. So that's also why we make sure we are using those. So now that we know how to sample for them as far as the adults, how do we sample for the larvae? Well, the first thing we do is we look for soybean that aren't looking as healthy as they should be early in the season. And so here are some wilting and dying plants here in the row. I want you to notice what's right here. We have soybean stubble obviously over here because we have corn. So immediately adjacent, and this is the first row where this was showing up, and we see this a lot. They are moving out and they hit that first row of soybean as soon as they can find it. So if you don't have wilting plants, uh, real early in the season what you can do so this is your very early vegetative stages start looking at the bases of the plant near the soil surface and it doesn't take long before you start picking up on what to look for so here's our soil surface here's our young i believe this is about a v3 v4 plant i'll probably see it in the next picture uh, but so pretty early what we see with a lot of soybean is that we have this natural split here down at the base of the stem uh, that's due to the rapid growth. So that's a natural phenomenon. Typically what happens is that heals back up, no issues. However, soybean gall midge see this as this nice entry point, essentially plants opening the doors and they're coming on in. And so under normal conditions, there shouldn't be this little bit of discoloration that we're seeing right here and also I say this a lot is you almost have to really be knowing what you're looking for. But right here, you can see a little bit easier in this picture. There's just this little bit of swelling in this early plant. And uh, as the name implies, these are making galls. Larvae make galls in the plant. In soybean, we aren't getting very large galls, but there is some swelling. And the whole point of a gall is that's a nutrient sink. And so you're the insects trying to gather as many nutrients into that one area as they can. Uh, my favorite plant to give an example of what a really big gall looks like is goldenrod. There's a gall forming insect that affects those. And so you'll get a large gall and goldenrod. And we're not getting something that pronounced in soybean, but there is a little bit of swelling here. And that's our first point. So uh, we, a lot of times we'll, if we see a plant like this when we're scouting, uh, soybean gall midge sampling is destructive. Uh, when we think about soybean aphids, we just go out into the field and we can count the aphids on the plant. But with soybean gall midge, they're under the epidermis, so it's a little bit tougher. Uh, when we're doing a lot of scouting, we used to crawl around on our hands and knees down the row to try to figure out where these plants were, count how many uh, plants we had that look like this, and then we do confirmations uh, uh, pulling plant random plants out of those counts and seeing how many larvae were in them. 
Uh, so it's a lot of a lot of time intensive work for scouting for soybean gall midge. But we have this little bit of swelling, the discoloration. So we pull the plant. And the first thing we do after we pull it is we do the will it will it lodge? Can we break it easily test? And so all we are doing, I mean, we're not working really hard on trying to break these plants. It's more of an issue of if we're applying a little bit of pressure, does it break like a really dry twig? And when soybean gall midge is present, they do. And you'll get a nice pop, a uh, very clean, clear sound. And if you notice where it breaks, it breaks right above where I said there was that little bit of swelling. If we look at the epidermis that I peeled back a little bit here and just around that area of the break, you'll notice there's discoloration. So that little bit of discoloration, that's where these larvae are actually feeding. That's typically right around that point up on top there. If we peeled down, we'd probably find more larvae. So here's what soybean gallmage larvae look like. Uh, they're fairly small, but you can see them very easily with your naked eye. In the later instars, they're this nice orange pink color, very easy to see. Earlier instars are a little bit lighter. I like this picture. This is actually from 2015. So this, this is what we saw originally when Connie and I went to a field. There's this white fungus, but it's not white mold. It's a white saprophytic fungus. We had it tested, didn't show up as any of the common plant diseases. And this isn't, it wasn't just us seeing this. A lot of the early reports for soybean gall midge saw that it was feeding on this. And we didn't see that huge discolored uh, area inside underneath the epidermis where these things were feeding. But we did see them on this white, uh, white fungus. We would occasionally see a little bit of discoloration on the epidermis where they were present. Uh, initially, we attributed that to, you know, that's where we had injuries. Uh, if we move forward, though, uh, this is what it looked like in a couple years after that 2015 observation. You can still see a little bit of that white fungus present, but if you notice now, we have this really discolored colored section of the plant here. And also, it's not just a little wounded area. We have the entire epidermis that was peeled back wherever we see these guys, it's really discolored. Also, if you're thinking about insect pests, typically when we think of stuff in the plant, you don't have a lot, but with soybean gall midge, as you can see here, we can have hundreds, if not thousands per plant. So a little bit different. And we definitely did see a transition though from what looked like maybe something that was just showing up because the plant was already infested with this other fungus. to now we have something that's taking advantage of soybean and actually feeding on it. And so there's three instars for soybean gall midge. The first instar this is just how the picture turned out, so I apologize that these uh, aren't in the order from top to bottom. The first instar are very small. They're white to clear. These are a little bit harder to see, so I had to zoom in with the camera to get this so that you could actually see that guy really well. The second instar are a little bit bigger. They're starting to get that pinkish orange color to them, and then the third instar are much larger. These are the ones that we can really see easily and they have that distinct coloration also. So those are the life stages of the soybean gall midge larva. Uh, and you can see here again, uh, the close up, you can really see that injury to the epidermis. So what's this look like, you know, June, July, early, earlier in the year? Well, it starts to look like maybe you had a little bit of a herbicide issue. That's what a lot of our initial calls were. It looked like maybe there was a little bit of overlap. The only issue is in a lot of these fields, same herbicide was applied to the corn and beans. And so the thing is, is it's so uniform. That's why at first nobody thought it was probably an insect. Infestation is so uniform. It's so uniform in fact, that it goes the entire length of the adjacent area between the corn and the soybean. So the entire field. And that's very uncommon. When we think of insect pests or diseases even for that matter, we typically think they start as a hot spot. 
And from that hot spot, then you get that radiation outwards. And so it grows, but it kind of stays the same shape. With the soybean gall midge, they pretty much hit the entire edge of a field. And then they move in from that. And so that's one of the things that we're still getting used to because uh, it's a little bit hard to see on this field. But if we, the same field here, you know, a little bit of weed pressure because there weren't plants to shade out the weeds. But as the season progresses, one of the issues we see with this pest is that we get a lot of weed development on the edges of the fields because there's no competition from the soybean. Another thing we notice is that this moves in pretty far. Uh, the dead plants typically are uh, on the edges of the field and they move in. We've seen it up to 100 feet into the field where we have this plant death. Uh, typically, the first couple passes of a combine uh, in these really infested fields can be 100% loss. But the other thing is we can find it, even though the plants don't look really bad, we can find it right in the middle of the field uh, as we move in. So they pretty much move throughout the field. The edges get hit the hardest. And so that's what this looks like. And it's not always 100% death. This picture is from Nebraska. But, you know, sometimes you'll have a few plants that are resilient, but eventually they're going to go down too because they're probably already infested. And this is what it looks like later season. So we still see that discoloration here. Here again is that fungus that we saw, but now it's a little bit on the outside too. But that discoloration, the swelling is a little bit more pronounced when you're scouting later in the season. So it's a little bit easier to see the difference there from the stem above it uh, to below it. It's a little bit more distinct. One of the big things when you're scouting later in the season is, is when you're walking through these really infested fields, you might not be right on the edge where the plants are dead, but as you even get in, it's going to sound like you're breaking sticks as you're walking through the field uh, because they're just all going to lodge. And so what to look for when you're scouting for this pest, and this is what we do, you look for wilting plants, a little bit of discoloration. As soon as you see that, you pull it, you break it, and you start peeling back the epidermis. Now the breaking it sometimes isn't so much just to see if it's brittle, but also because that can help you get that epidermis started if you don't have a knife on you. Uh, if you are using your fingernail, typically by the end of the summer, my thumbnail doesn't have a connection with the skin about halfway down because I peeled so many ep uh, soybean epidermises back. If I'm just using my fingers, uh, it is a little bit hard on your hands and you'll notice it. You'll have a very sore thumb for a few days. Uh, but it's a little bit hard. It's you know a little bit hard to do with a, a normal pocket knife, so uh, it kind of leaves us in between. But that's why we snap because then we can peel a little bit faster. But uh, you look for that stem swelling, and then any dead plants on the edge of the field uh, also are your dead giveaway. So that's where you should always start is on the edge, especially if you're by a shelter belt grove or this year's corn. And that's what I'm saying here. Uh, those areas where you really need to target are edges of the fields and really any place that you have corn and soybean really close together. Uh, if it's one field and you split it, that's probably where these are going to show up first. It's important to note that soybean gall midge isn't our only gall midge insect in a soybean field. So uh, University of Minnesota researchers came across this a couple of years ago out when they were scouting. They kept seeing white mold in the field and on the white mold, they kept seeing these orange larvae that look really similar to the soybean gall midge. Uh, but when they sent them off to get them identified, uh, they used genetic tests to compare the two, not the same species. So there's a white mold gall midge that we can have in the area as well. The thing with this is it will only show up in fields where there is white mold and it only will feed on the white mold. Uh, so I don't have the picture here. This is it feeding on white mold in the center of the stem, but uh, they have pictures of this thing feeding on white mold on the leaves, on the stems, on the outside, and so it really hunts down the white mold. And why do we care so much? Well, for soybean gall midge, we can see quite a bit of yield loss, and so that's why we're really targeting this pest. We want to try to get it figured out. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of recommendations for you. So far, we've seen that tillage doesn't really do a lot to it. 
One of the big things is, is if you get rid of vegetation around the fields early, early, this is before you have your soybean emerging, that can kind of help. Uh, another thing though, is that planting date. Earlier, the earlier you get in the field, it tends to be better with this pest, uh, probably because your plants have already healed. That wounded area at the base is healed, so it's harder for the uh, soybean gall midge to get in. Foliar insecticides uh, applied with regular nozzles aren't the best. Uh, we're doing some work this year to really evaluate drop nozzles. Uh, that seems to be where uh, the best best emerge, uh, best treatment for those emerging populations is. So I think I'm about out of time, but here's my contact information. For those of you on today, if you have some fields that you'd like scouted, or if you'd like some of those traps to monitor soybean gall midge populations, please let me know. Uh, feel free to shoot me an email uh, right here. Be happy to get some cages to you, or we'd bring cages down and monitor your field for you. Uh, but we're happy to work uh, with anybody that's interested because this is a pest we'd like to get under, under our management a little bit sooner than later. And so far we don't have a lot of recommendations. So thank you and I'll turn it over to you, Connie. All right, thank you. Um, Adam, there is a question in the chat. Is there information on where this pest is native to? Uh, well, it looks like Dale, since it was never, never identified anywhere else, uh, there's, there are some anecdotal references to it from the UK and dry bean. Um, but it, right now it looks like it's probably native to the US, uh, especially since it's using uh, you know, some alternative hosts here. We don't know the full host history, but since it hasn't been reported anywhere else in the world officially and had never been identified, that makes it really tricky. So uh, as of right now, you know, our best guess is native to the, you know, North America. And, you know, that's one of the big, big projects going onward is trying to figure out if this had an original host uh, before it moved to soybean. And if so, what is it? So uh, I didn't say a lot because I know the University of Nebraska, they're working on a paper on the alternative host. Uh, hopefully that's out soon, but it doesn't look like it uses alfalfa that much. Uh, it, we haven't observed any issues where an alfalfa field starts to die from soybean gall midge, uh, but from what they've told me, it does look like sweet clover is a pretty good host. Uh, but sweet clover isn't normally something we worry about, uh, you know, an insect really causing issues. And they said it doesn't look like it kills the sweet clover. So, uh, yeah, not no information on where it originally came from if it isn't from here. And if it is from here, we don't know where it started from. So. What, what plant was it originally feeding on? Because, you know, one of the things we wonder is how long was it in soybean? And if it was in soybean longer, did we just not see it because we weren't worrying about the base of the plant? We weren't really messing around down there much. But also, uh, you know, some of these issues we're seeing now, it's obvious that it wasn't, you know, from when Connie and I went out to the field, that field didn't have a, uh, what we call the dead edge. Uh, the issue is actually further into the field where we are seeing some of this. And so, you know, when, when did it make that big change and what, what even caused that is stuff that we need to answer, but we, we're still working on it. Uh, with these new pests, it does take some time to get the, the wheels turning and to get some information started on them. So thanks for your question. Is there any other quick question for Adam? All right. Going to move into the next portion here. This is our soybean investigations research on your farm portion, talking about the soybean on farm program. But before we get started on that, I just have a quick poll if you don't mind. Just one question long, pretty easy. So, Matt, if you could launch that first poll. I'm just curious if you have participated in on farm research.
And once it looks like we've got a pretty good portion of answers, you can go ahead and show the results there, Matt. All right, so we've a little over half have participated in farm research. Some of you have not, and that's okay. I just kind of like to have a quick pulse check of the group. I'm kind of talking a little bit some of our opportunities that we have going forward. You know, so, oh, come on, computer, don't lock. You might ask um, with this program, you know, why would you want to participate in on-farm research? Why is it important? With soybeans, you know, soybean is a major crop here in South Dakota. Last year, we planted um, 4.95 million acres in 2020. In 2018, we're just over 5.2 million acres. You know, so we kind of little up and down a little bit. A lot of that's, you know, looking at different commodity prices, looking at the weather, but soybean remains to be one of our major crops here in South Dakota. One of the things when you're looking at on-farm research and just as we just got done hearing from Adam, you know, soybean pests are constantly evolving. You know, we're always looking to, you know, scout for those pests, but they're constantly evolving, changing. We wanted to kind of stay up to date on that. There's an overwhelming assortment of chemical products. You know, there's a lot of different products out there. They claim a lot of different things, but at the end of the day, if you're a soybean producer, no matter if you're in South Dakota or where you're at, you want to say, you want to be able to be sustainable. You want to stay in business. And so we want to help kind of break down the barriers of what works, what doesn't, what's the best, you know, for your farming operation, because not every operation is the same. We really see the big need for a cost effective production system and then also just another way to help manage those input costs you know really we're looking at ways to control disease insects weeds fertility issues again kind of going back to that overwhelming amount of products out there and so we really want to kind of help work with individual producers to look at the different um, look at different issues that works on their farm but enough about the how and the why i mean we could go talk about that all day. You know, when we look at our soybean on farm program, really, we want to empower the South Dakota soybean growers to expand the knowledge of how to conduct and evaluate on farm research. You know, so that's something that you're able to continue on and do it on your own, how to interpret a lot of those results. We want to enhance your soybean yields. Again, we'd like to continue to be sustainable. We want to enhance your soybean production, improve your on farm profits, because if you're not making money, you're not able to stay in business and that doesn't do anyone any good. So again, really want to enhance the sustain sustainability of for the state soybean producers. With this program, it is a producer led on farm program. So what that means is each individual farming operation could look at something different. We're not having to do a statewide huge push now, don't get me wrong, we do have that portion with our on-farm program also that we can um, target specific pests or chemicals, if you will, but the extension portion of it is more of the producer-led, meaning if there's an issue on your farm that you'd like to tackle or work with, we have a team of specialists and field specialists that are willing and able to help work with that. With our on-farm program, it does provide an online platform for producers to interact and learn. Again, not only from the scientists and researchers, but from other producers. Because a lot of times when we went out and presented data or we we're at different programs, you know, we'll hear from you saying, you know, that's great. That worked in the southeastern part of the state, but does it really work up north? Does it work on my farm? And so this is a way for you to check that out. Um, I put it in the chat, but as you see in the screen here, there's an online platform. So it's onfarmresearch.soybean South Dakota soybean.org. If you'd click on that, it would bring you to that program. And we'll get into that here in a second. But with the online platform, it encompasses all of the information of participants throughout the state. And it's just a wealth of data really looking at 
over the years and different topics, but we'll get into that in a second. Real briefly, I'm just curious, Matt, if you could launch poll number two, are you familiar with the South Dakota Soybean On-Farm Research Program? Once it looks like we have a pretty good respondent, I'd ask you to close the poll and share those results. All right, so about a 50-50 split. Well, hopefully as we go through today's program, you'll have heard a little bit more about it Okay, come on. What it is, is, is a partnership with South Dakota Soybean Research and Promotion Council with SDSU Extension and the Ag Experiment Station. We have many different researchers, you know, providing soybean research and looking at soybean issues. And with this partnership, it allows again, that tailored on-farm experience, but it also provides data mining across the state which is put into that platform that South Dakota Soybean Research and Promotion Council funds. So it lives on a website on its own. Um, it is a team effort. This is just a quick look at some of the field specialists and state specialists that are on the extension side of things that work with this program. Again, this is not everybody because now we've added a few new people and that doesn't take into account all of the a, the researchers on campus that are affiliated with the egg experiment and not necessarily extension but it is a great partnership with the South Dakota soybean program. You know, the type of research that we work with within the program, you know, the short answer is anything. You know, we're only limited by your imagination or ideas or opportunities that, you know, you put on yourself. Um, the other short answer is that any of this programming must be soybean related. We can have large plots, we can have small plots, and we can have strips. So depending on your comfort zone or what you would like to look at or work with within that project, sometimes we're better able to grasp that data from small plots, sometimes it's large plots, and sometimes it is those strips, you know, going across that the area, or if we just kind of put things together across the state. So there's a lot of different opportunity there. It's not just focused on one way or the other. When we talk about some of these possibilities. Again, as you look at this list, I mean, you can read as well as I can, there's just a lot of different choices there, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, it really boils down to there's unlimited ideas and opportunities for the on-farm research. You know, some that I've been a part of has been some of the pesticide choices, some fertility issues, soybean cis nematode, and looking at fungicide, which would make sense since I work with plant pathology. But again, any one of these issues or topics or others that you know are not on this list are perfect for the South Dakota Soybean on-farm program. Again, this would be the platform, so the online platform. So it's that onfarmresearch.sdsoybean.org, and you'll find that in the chat. It'll link you right to this page, as you see here as a screen. And there's a lot of different opportunities to play around on the website. So there's trial results, there's a ability to participate, there's some information about the program, who to contact, you know, really within this website, there's a wealth of data from the on-farm research and test strips that are across the state. You know, like it says, it's just at your fingertips, you know, you just log in. So again, you can participate or you can just be someone that views the information either way. You know, so what do you find if you go to view trials or take a look inside? Well, we'll briefly, every, program or trial that's been a part of the program, you're going to see some information about it or some stats. So you're going to find that information that's specific to your area because you can search from a lot of different venues or ways to look at that information. You know, you can filter by county, soil type, previous crop, planning date, you know, a lot of different information. If there were the larger strips, if we used um, or larger plots and we used the yield monitor, we'll see like this yield 
um, field overlay map on each of the reports. You know, they always have the results and it's got all of the history. So as much as you can provide into the system helps with looking at the data or the information, if you will. When you would click to look at the trial results, you know, the first thing you're gonna see is you're gonna see this map of the state and you're gonna sh see it shaded a little bit darker of a color of different counties where we've had participation. Again, so there's a whole wealth of data and projects available to us there. You can look that way. You can, again, when we talk about the, the sorting or the filtering, if you will, you know, so looking at planting date, cover crop, tillage, you know, if you want to have any fertilizer or fungicide. So you can reset that. You can look at it any number of different ways. It will pull you up to those limited number or the number minimum number of projects or programs that we have worked with over the years. If you were to go and just click the view trials, you're just going to see them all laid out. They start way on the right, you're going to see the dates. And so they start by the year of date and they'll go down to the oldest trial. So you're able to look at all of them that way if you like. Or if you are interested in, let's say, wanting to just see a project that applied fungicide, you can search by just the fungicide and you have the option of yes, fungicide was applied or no, it was not applied. So you can look at different studies that way. In this case, I chose that fungicide was applied. So it brought it down to about like 36 different projects. From here, just to kind of give you an idea of what some of the things look at, you know, I chose a late season Stratego fungicide application. So I pulled that because it was in Minnehaha County. You notice all on the left side of the screen with the general stats, kind of like the information about that field or the program that was put onto the field. It lays out the materials and methods, like when the Stratego was applied. In this case, it was at R3. It showed the different locations of where it was applied, the rate that was utilized, how it was applied. This was more of a smaller plot application, talked about the number of reps and how it was randomized, if you will. So you're able to look at that type of information. You're able to look at the rainfall and temperature, kind of really showcasing what the conditions were at that point in time when this was applied, looking at the introduction and materials and methods, kind of laying it out of how the project was done. And then again, every one of the projects or trials in this research program will summarize the results that was found within that trial. Again, you can click on a lot of the graphs to make them larger. So in this case, showing the data of the way it turned out in 2016 of that Stratego applied at that R3 stage of growth. We learned that within each site, it was not significant to apply that fungicide. So that's something, so just that wealth of information, kind of looking back, kind of seeing what's worked, what hasn't worked and looking at those, you know, temperature and moistures really gives you a pretty good idea of the trials and data and whether or not you should attempt it. So again, you know, it summarizes saying that the disease pressure was very low to non-existent at each of the locations. You know, we still went through with putting on that fungicide, that there was no significant differences found when that fungicide was applied. You know, so with the trials, there's a lot of opportunity to take a look as to what's there and what, and what do you see. Again, you can reassess, you can click as many different buttons to pull the information as you want to try to get as close to, let's say your area, or maybe you're only wanting to look for studies in the county that you're farming in. You're able to do that too within the program. Um, if you want to participate, you know, there's a couple of ways. You can click that participate button. You can put in your own information and you can add your own trials, or you can be contacted by a researcher, whether it's extension or an a, a an egg experiment researcher, why I cannot say that word today, and they will certainly help 
talk you through as to what you're thinking about on your farm, something that you want to work with, and they'll help lay out that research. And so there's a lot of opportunities there, you know, really encourage you to take a look at the on farm program to participate. Again, you're able to participate by entering in information on your own, or you can work with one of us, but again, your information will be entered into the data pool, whether you are entering in your own information or you participate, you will be assigned a researcher. So this is kind of looking at the back end of things, some stuff that you wouldn't see. So you're able to see who the use were on the back end, are able to see who the users are, pending trials, and then we're working with those end results that get put up onto that website. And so every project is looked at. It's not just with a hope and a prayer. You know, we do have extension faculty and researchers that are working to make sure that it is sound data going up on that website. So what's needed for the soybean on-farm project? You, we need South Dakota soybean growers. We need the consultants to help and encourage a lot of the on-farm. You know, we wanna have data that works for our state instead of always having to look other ways and other avenues, you know, but it starts with you. We really need that help and participation with our South Dakota soybean growers. And so I would like to invite Matt, if he could pull up poll number three. Just kind of curious, if you're thinking about conducting on-farm research this year, No matter how you answer, this is all anonymous, so it's not going to tie you or obviously commit you to anything. All right, so we still have some folks that are interested in conducting on-farm research. You know, encourage that. For those that you are currently saying no, if you, whether you're a soybean grower or not, if you have some interest in on-farm, the nice thing with our soybean on-farm project is the Soybean Council underwrites most of those expenses for that type of program or research. So encourage you to you know, think about that. If you're growing other commodities, we do have some other grants or limited grants that we could assist with some on-farm research. But thank you for answering that. Sorry, my computer is just a little bit laggy. I just want to give a special thanks to the South Dakota Sleeping Research and Promotion Council for funding the on-farm program for seeing that need and for creating our website with the wealth of information that they have and maintaining that is something that we're able to look back, you know, over the years and kind of seeing what's working, what hasn't. Again, some of our projects we, we've tailored for some large issue. Sometimes they're not. So really, we're really saying that within the on-farm program, we have an ability to really focus on each individual soybean grower and look at their programs. So again, thank you to South Dakota Soybean Research Promotion Council for funding this program. And just wanna leave you with my contact information on the off chance that you would have any questions or would like to follow up with some of the soybean on-farm opportunities. I'm not able to see the chat, but if there's any questions, you know, please feel free to put them into chat or the Q&A at the moment. I just want to take the time to thank everyone for joining us today. Want to draw your attention to the chat where you'll find the link to our presentation recordings from previous crop clinics 
or crop sessions starting back in January on through March here. So if you missed a session or you would like to go back and rewatch a session or grab some information, feel free to find that link in the chat. Also in the chat, there's the link to the South Dakota pest guides and other publications. So you could request those printed copies of those publications since we're not able to see you or be here in person. Ordinarily, we'd bring that with. That way we can get them mailed to you because we really would still want to get that information out. It doesn't do us any good sitting back in our offices or on our desks. Would also like to bring your attention to a survey for our weekly crop hour um, feedback survey, if you will. We've had some issues with it going out on Friday. So I just wanted to show the link there in the chat. Um, I encourage you to fill that out at the conclusion of our crop hour. If you were only able to attend the first couple of days here, would ask you to fill that out sooner. Also, there is a link to register for Soy 100. That is next week. This is again the link and a QR code for the weekly crop hour survey. This one is not the CCA credits one as we're kind of waiting here. Just want to make mention of we'll have crop hour again tomorrow. We're going to have a presentation by Anthony Bly and Kristen Weber where they're going to talk about precision profitability, precision profitability through every acre counts. That'll be on Thursday. And then on Friday, we round out the week with Dr. Jonathan Kleinjohn talking about South Dakota field crops and kind of giving an update about the program, the SCCU Plant Diagnostic Clinic and the seed testing lab with Dr. Emmanuel Bayam Kema and Dr. Brent Chertup Seed. So I encourage and invite you to come out for that. Hopefully everyone's had a chance to Fill out that QR code. If you could real quick also do the follow-up survey here for the presentation, that would be wonderful. All the polls and surveys really help us plan different presentations, plan topics of things that worked, what didn't work, things that you'd like to see and kind of help shape our programs for the future. So if you'd be so kind to fill that out. All right, again, we kind of talked a little bit about the rest of this week. We do have Soybean Soy 100 next week. If you would like to register for that, please find that link in the chat. We'd love to see you. Um, and then next week's crop hour is gonna be water, weather and climate. So I encourage you and invite you to attend. And for those that might have any interest in staying after and having a continued conversation, informal discussion about Soybean Gull Midge or any of the on-farm opportunities, we'd love to stay and visit with you. So with that, I just wanna thank you all for your time. All right. Well, Adam, how are things shaping up on the soybean gall midge side? Well, it's, you know, Connie, it's looking a lot like the last couple of years. Uh, you know, one of the things we are still working on is what, what are the spring conditions that are really favorable for this pest? And if we look at some of our worst infestation years, it's during wetter springs. And so, uh, I don't know what the weather's doing everywhere else around Brookings. It's a little bit wet today, 
Uh, but I think we're probably at enough of a deficit. Even this rain's not going to make us, you know, take us out of what I think we're in some of the uh, dry, dry or drought conditions. So, you know, if it's dry, it's hard to say this spring. Uh, this will be one of the first springs where we've known that this is a major issue and been have really been scouting for it. And so I think we'll learn a lot. But uh, even during our prevent plant year, uh, we still had a lot of fields infested and uh, something we'll really have to watch for. But yeah, just just one of those pests that it kind of surprised us and you were there from the start too. And so we'll have to keep keep learning about it, but definitely, definitely a lot to learn. Yep. For those of you that joined us here, do you have any questions or comments? Okay. It looks like there is something from in the chat, um, a comment from Emmanuel. It seems to me some varieties don't have that natural splitting on the stem and hence would be less susceptible. Yeah, Emmanuel, that's a great observation of yours. Uh, that is something that uh, we've been looking into. Uh, so there's there's a large variety evaluation going on. Uh, it's started a year ago, but uh, you know some some seem to do, have more of a split than others. But uh, you know, it's one of those things that we have to just kind of monitor because even even when we don't have that full split. Uh, one of the other sources for entry down towards the base of the stem is when those those early cotyledons uh, leaves drop. Uh, you know, when we lose some of those first leaves that we get on the plant, those fall off as the plant develops. And even that, in some cases, can be a, a point of entry that we've seen. So the earliest, though, is that, that little bit of a split. But then these things are very opportunistic. And, you know, we've, we've even seen them you know, on the tops of the plants uh, where we've had hailstone injuries. So anything that breaks that epidermis because the the flies don't have an ovipositor that's necessary, they'd almost need a, a saw blade to get through that soybean epidermis when you consider how small these flies are. And they don't have that. So they're, they're really relying on those natural openings or created openings to get into the plant. So Jim, Jason, Dale, have any of you experienced skull midge or have seen it? I probably didn't know what I was looking for. Maybe I saw it in fields. Yeah, no, it's it's surprising when you start when once you once you get that image in your mind of what you're looking for, uh, it's, you know, in terms of the plant conditions and then uh, those target areas on the edges of the field, you can really find it a lot of places. I haven't and, seen those severe uh, damages like you were showing on the, some of your pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, uh, you know, even in healthy, it's when we do the survey, a lot of times we'll stop on the edge of a, uh, if we see a shelter belt, we'll stop and check those uh, soybean, uh, you know, right on the edge of the shelter belt. And they can be, you know, nice and green soybean, but they can still be infested. But I think a lot of it has to do with how many are present, how many of the larvae are present, and then when they got in the plant. So some of these later season ones, we don't see the plant die. Uh, they might have a little bit of wilting, but they won't fully die right away. So that might help you, Dale, when you're when you're out this this summer driving around too, uh, you know, might help. And if you if you do see any fields, uh, this goes for anybody. If you think you see a field and you peel back the epidermis and see some of the orange larvae, uh, take your cell phone and snap a picture and then uh, send it, you know, to me, Connie. Connie can get it to me. Uh, we found that that actually works really well for identification and. There is enough of a difference between these and the white mold gall midge that even later in the season, we can be pretty confident in our identifications, even based on pictures. So when they move into the soil, then are they done by harvest or is this something that can be moved 
Uh, how, does, how does it get moved? Do you think? You know, I I don't think that we're. You know, it's a good question. I don't know if we're doing a lot of mechanical movement with these things uh, because most of the fields that we've scouted later in the season, uh, you can see evidence that they were present, but we don't find a lot of the live larvae, you know, close to harvest. The plant, as soon as those plants start to dry down, even the ones they kill, they abandon ship. And so it's it's kind of like a, a mass exit and they all, they all, all the larvae jump out. And I'm guessing even the ones that weren't mature enough, you know, it just, they need that moisture coming up from the plant. And when that, uh, when that stops and the nutrient flow stops, they're gone. But, uh, you know, kind of July, August is when we see some of those heaviest infestations. But there's been some questions uh, people have asked me about where we do have tillage in South Dakota. Are we, are we moving around, moving these around with our tillage equipment? And, you know, there's the possibility, but we don't know for sure. Uh, so they're not as small as, you know, Connie and Emmanuel deal with soybean cyst nematodes. Those are really small. The eggs can be in the soil. Uh, these are a little bit, you know, these are observable with the naked eye. And so they might be in a clump of soil, but, you know, most of the times I don't think we're moving enough. The biggest thing is since the flies are pretty small, there's a chance that they're getting kind of like our soybean aphids. They get taken up by the wind and they can get carried probably. And that's part of why we think we see so many around shelter belts and groves is our natural, our natural wind breaks that we have out there to slow the wind down uh, are also acting as a way to, you know, for, you know act, acting as a natural collecting system for these soybean gall midge flies probably. And so when the flies get deposited into those areas, that's probably why we, we get larger infestations around trees. Uh, just because it slowed the wind down and they landed, they're soybean there, they'll take advantage of that. In the chat, Jason had said that he saw it in Hand County in 2019, but it wasn't anything severe. Okay. Well, yeah, that's, uh, you know, looking, looking I, I, I mentioned, I think it's probably a lot, in a lot more areas than what we even know. Uh, but if you see it again, Jason, uh, you know, feel free to shoot me a, an email or a picture. And uh, I'd be happy to happy to go out and take a look. Or if you send me a picture and it's real easy to see that, that'll be enough too. But, you know, we found it. I had some pictures sent from Hyde from a couple fields uh, this year. And, you know, my guess is anywhere we have soybean, we're probably going to find soybean gall midge. Maybe not. Maybe not in the past, maybe not next year, but the way it seems to move in other states as well, you know, if you look at, think back to that graph I showed in the uh, figure of Nebraska, every year they keep finding it further west. And it's not because they weren't necessarily looking out there. Uh, it just seems like it is expanding its range a little bit. So, and if it is moving on the wind, there's not a lot we can do about that. But I'd, uh, for you, Jason, I'd really scout that field uh, in that area, those soybean fields, and just keep an eye on it because uh, what we saw in some of our other counties is once it gets established, that's, it really ramps up and it doesn't take a lot of time. So in a couple of years, you could have a pretty large population. Well, I know you mentioned about the jars and lids probably being in short supply. The Ace Hardware on like 41st in Minnesota, if you will, they've been getting in regular shipments of canning stuff. They have the, the screw on lids with the flats, but no flats on its own. So I'm not sure which lids you're looking for particularly. Yeah, we, we, we just need the, the rings uh, because we actually, we use a nail gun and nail the rings to the little board that goes up and then uh, screw the jar on. So I'll have to have you send me that information, Connie, and since Phil's down in Sioux Falls, I'll have him stop by periodically and see if we can't get some. But our, our goal is to this spring yet uh, build, we've been waiting for the weather to warm up a little bit, uh, just so it's a little bit more enjoyable to be out in the shop, but we're planning on building quite a few more of these cages. So uh, 
you know, we're looking for anybody that's interested, even if you just want a couple, uh, we'd be happy to bring them to you. And then uh, the sampling's pretty easy. It's just counting, counting little flies uh, each week. So, and we even would come and do that too, if uh, you'd want us to. So we, we'd be happy to spread out our sampling uh, efforts a little bit, you know, from that figure it showed, we're still pretty concentrated down in the Southeast, but we'd ideally like to get some more traps set out in more areas of the state to monitor our fields and just see how many we actually have emerging. So to give you guys an idea, we put these out for the first time back in 2018, uh, in 2018, 2019, and we, we didn't really catch anything. We caught one and we knew, we knew we were in fields that had had issues. So, uh, you know, we, we aren't quite sure in South Dakota, we don't get the same numbers that they do, but down in the Southeast, we get some pretty large populations emerging. So we'll keep monitoring. And, uh, you know, it's a possibility in our state too that they're emerging from one area and maybe they're still moving around a little bit until they get established. So we'll have to keep an eye out. Adam, you're just gonna have to go shopping on Craigslist and Facebook for your jars. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the problem is, is, uh, uh, per, you know, for state employees and uh, university employees to purchase things, uh, it's a little bit harder. We can't really do the cash as easy. So <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier for us to, to do credit card transactions. So, but yeah, that we, you know, we might honestly get to that point where we might have to do some of that because, uh, you know, last, last fall, you absolutely could last summer and fall, you absolutely could not find these supplies and uh, that or we need to transition to something different. We've been talking about that too. The nice thing with the glass jars though is when you're walking up to them, you can peek in and see if you have any before you unscrew them and uh, then you know whether or not you need to be a little bit more careful when you're putting the lids on uh, or covering them up. So, but you know, we'll have to, we'll have to get something figured out because it, we're heading into mid-March and we'd like to get these out as soon as the weather's favorable and uh, some fields get planted. So that could that could be sooner than later, I think. You guys have any other questions? Sarah, you have any thoughts? for on-farm research, Golmage. You know, I thought it was interesting. I was late coming into this, so I missed it. Sorry, I've helped today, but I thought that, um, Adam, your comments on Golmage, you know, and the comments here that it's not necessarily always so bad um, and it's harder to see. I think that's one of the biggest things people don't notice it when they have an early infestation. But yep. in general, I think you guys did a good job covering it. And we're always looking for people to do on-farm research with. So it's always good if you have a topic. If you want an easy project to start with, you have Adam here willing to put stuff out on the farm and come do the work. So other than just not driving over it, it's pretty easy for you. Yeah, and uh, I didn't show the picture. We do put marking flags, the, the really tall flags with each cage, just to, it helps us uh, find them again. Uh, and we also, you know, that helps to make sure everybody knows where they are in the field. So we, you know, they, they aren't really expensive. The, I think it takes more time than money to put these little traps together, but they, they are not durable. Uh, you know, we've had we haven't had anybody run these over, but in the past, when a tractor tire hits one of these, even if it's just on the corner, they kind of explode. So I should mention, you know, entomologists, we aren't, we aren't necessarily carpenters. We just kind of dabble. So <laughs> not probably the highest quality construction. Uh, but yet Sarah brought up, you know, a good point, And that's something we are looking into is, you know, when we have these infestations that maybe we aren't seeing the severe plant death, some of the work we're doing is looking into those fields to see if we can monitor. And if we monitor the field and see that there's there's an infestation, but we don't lose plant, uh, a lot of plants due to just the infestation, 
we're curious still what that impact is because you know we've seen it in those really hard hit fields the edges are dead but when we take yields from the middle of the fields we still see reductions uh, so maybe it's not as much but you know we we have an insect that's stopping the nutrient and water flow to the upper part of the plant and if that's occurring around pod formation we're, we're going to get reduced seed weight or just reduced number of pods we've seen in some fields where the plants start aborting pods so the plant will be lush and green yet might lodge if you push on it but uh, one of the big issues is, is if you don't get that pod development, you can have the nicest looking plant in the world, but you need those pods to really make it pay off. So we'll have to keep keep work, working on that. And we're working on quite a few new evaluations for products. That's, that's an ongoing thing. And then also, as I mentioned, we're really heading the direction of the drop nozzles. There's been some really promising work done with those. Uh, and if you think about where we're trying to stop the pest from getting in, if it's towards the base of the plant, it makes sense that those that's that setup might be our best option so we'll keep you all posted though as we we find things out and as we get some of these evaluations done so emmanuel do you have any good on-farm topics oh there's always a lot that can be done on farm so um with our area being, you know, disease management, um, any interest in white mold management, um, foliar fungicide timing, new products uh, testing on farm, uh, all these would be topics that I'm interested in. So if there are people that would like to have these on-farm trials started on their farms, we're more than happy to collaborate on that. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I just wanna be respectful of everyone's time and not keep you here if, if we're running out of things. Anything that you'd like to see us do, Jim or Dale, in the area of on-farm, whether it's soybean or not? Not specifically, I guess. Well, if you think of something, you know, just reach out to any one of us and we can see what we can do on that. We're always open up open for ideas and thoughts and ideas and suggestions. Jim, you have any thoughts? just kind of ask one more time before we sign off since we're getting kind of close to that top of the half hour mark if you will it was nice to hear the rain this morning what do you mean rain we got snow oh I'm sorry that's projected for later for us, but we got some rain. So things could be pretty slippery. That's a good thing. Well, I just wanna thank you all for turning out for today's session and hopefully if you're able to make it, join us tomorrow. Thanks for doing these things. These are fun. Yep. Thank you.